Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, today for this uh, chat about innovation policy uh, in Canada. Uh, my name is Murad Hamadi. Uh, I'm the Ottawa correspondent uh, at The Logic, which is a Canadian business publication focused on the innovation economy. Uh, there's some chance you knew that already because you're here. Um, we're talking today um, about um, the uh, Business Council uh, of Canada's uh, proposal um, or recommendation that Ottawa set up something like um, the US DARPA, um, an agency that uh, does a whole bunch of things that we'll get into. Um, the Business Council of Canada uh, is an organization that represents the CEOs of some of the country's uh, biggest companies. Um, the uh, council says it's time to set bold national goals to transform Canada's scientific and research strengths into economic performance. Uh, and to do that, um, they say we need something uh, akin to the uh, US's Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, which I will not say again throughout this call because it's a mouthful, uh, but DARPA. Um, we're in that glorious time of year in Ottawa, pre-budget season. Uh, and um, this uh, briefing call is with uh, Robert Asselin, uh, a former advisor to uh, two prime ministers and at least one finance minister, um, and the senior vice president of policy at the Business Council of Canada. Uh, Robert leads the council's work on economic recovery and the development of policies that contribute to economic growth and job creation. He's also responsible for fiscal and tax policy. Prior to joining the council, Robert was senior global director of public policy at BlackBerry, a company with which I'm sure you're all familiar. Uh, Robert brings more than 10 years of experience in providing economic advice to government, including in roles as policy and budget director to Canada's finance minister and as a policy advisor to Prime Ministers Paul Martin and Justin Trudeau. Robert also spent nearly a decade in academia as Associate Director of the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs at the University of Ottawa, and as a visiting public policy scholar at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, DC. He continues to serve as a fellow at the University of Toronto's Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy and at the Public Policy Forum, where he wrote a couple of really interesting reports about the intangibles economy that I'm sure we'll also get into. Um, so, uh, Robert, welcome, uh, and thank you so much uh, for joining us. Um, I'm going to uh, now uh, hand it over to you uh, to outline uh, this idea and kind of set the ground for what we're going to be talking about today. So take it away. Thank you, everyone. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. Thank you, Murad, for this kind introduction. And uh, special thanks to The Logic for uh, hosting this event. I think everyone agrees that uh, The Logic plays an important part in this uh, innovation quest we have in Canada to try to understand better innovation, but also foster it. So thank you uh, to David and all his team for organizing the event. I thought today I'd do. Um, uh, try to simplify things and try to answer three straightforward questions that I think a lot of people may have on this call on uh, DARPA uh, and why the Business Council of Canada came out with this recommendation and idea. And, and the three questions uh, essentially are why, uh, why DARPA or a DARPA R&D-like institution, uh, what, what it could be uh, in Canada, and how it could function. Um, so those are the three questions I'll briefly speak to before we to, uh, we go to the Q&A. So on, on the what, um, well, I'm sorry, on the why, why should we have a, a DARPA-like uh, institution uh, in, in Canada? I think before we answer the specifics of why a DARPA-like uh, R&D powerhouse in Canada, we need to ask ourselves, um, how does innovation fit in the growth conversation, in economic growth and conversation, and why is it important? And I think um, if we're honest with ourselves, uh, we know that over the medium and long term, Canada faces considerable headwinds when it speaks, when it when it uh, when it talks about or when it thinks about economic growth. And the structural weaknesses uh, are are kind of well known. First, I think we've had uh, numerous reports talk about our productivity issue, the fact that in advanced industry, we're less productive, for example, than our US counterparts. And secondly, that we're a fast 
aging society, and that creates uh, obvious pressures on the economy, the labor force, and how we will sustain growth uh, going forward. So, uh, you know, a lot of people um, have different theories of growth, but I think we need to be honest with ourselves. And to me, it is clear that neither real estate or consumption or deficit spending will solve for what we have to solve for in the long term, which is sustained, inclusive economic growth. And that's where innovation comes in. And I think, uh, you know, basic economics will tell you that innovation plays a key role in enhancing our productive capacity. And I think this is where we've been a bit weak in Canada, where we need to do better. And so this is how uh, it fits in a bigger picture. So essentially the why uh, is that innovation is really key to solve the growth. And why now uh, is that uh, in this post-pandemic kind of global economy, um, a lot of countries are positioning themselves to do big plays on science, technology, and Canada needs to uh, think hard about, I think, how we want to position ourselves in that regard. So that can just happen if we don't get better at innovation. We need to give our firms, our companies, an edge on innovation so that they can have a competitive advantage uh, in world markets. And uh, innovation, as most people know on this call, is not a straightforward process. It doesn't happen naturally or just because we'd like it to happen. It, it operates in a public-private partnership where governments, I think, play an important role. And just give a very simple example that I think everybody can relate to when we think about something like the iPhone. Most of the technologies that are in the iPhone were funded one way or the other by the US government. And so to think that some VC fund or some good entrepreneurs by themselves can solve the innovation uh, problem, I think is wishful thinking. We need something that is uh, more long-term driven and sustainable going forward. So what are the challenges we need to fix when we speak about innovation? I'll speak to three challenges that are, I think, uh, very clear to us. The first is, we must uh, stop thinking that basic research or funding universities will translate naturally in innovation. Uh, when we look at uh, where we're coming from, it surely hasn't, and it won't going forward. Second, I think we need to do a much better job on linking public funded R&D to industry and ensure uh, technology transfers uh, into products and services. So what we're lacking essentially, and I think this is pretty consensual, is this bridge, this solid bridge between intellectual capital and our companies, how essentially we do applied research in this country. And third, um, I've personally written about this uh, quite a bit, we must create, leverage, and retain uh, more of our intellectual property in Canada. And the logic there is that if we are to invest in our public R&D, it should be a long-term investment in our ability to become more innovative and productive. So uh, before I go into the what, I just want to be clear, we're not pretending here that an institution like this will solve all the problems. Uh, it's obviously one ingredient in a, in a recipe, I'd say, that is complex and, and uh, you know, that has many ingredients. But I think uh, by no way we are suggesting that a DARPA-like R&D powerhouse will solve by itself our innovation uh, problem. So just on the what, what is it that we're talking about? For those who don't know DARPA, um, just quickly, uh, it came out really as a result of the Americans wanted to be the first to send a satellite in space by being beaten by the Russians. And Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, essentially in 58, his reaction was to create uh, kind of a, a brain power for the Pentagon, for the, the army to have a research capacity so that this will never happen again. And uh, it's quite amazing over the years what DARPA has accomplished. Uh, essentially, it does two things. 
uh, DARPA imagine the future and it solves problems and it does it very well. I think it's well regarded around the world, uh, but it, it also operates in a very specific model and I'll speak to it in a second. I think it's important to understand the design of that institution. But just to name a few successes that DARPA had over the years, uh, they created the building blocks for the GPS, the first computer mouse, and essentially the protocols that underpin the modern internet. More recently, I think a lot of people say, oh, what has DARPA done recently? Well, when you think about the biggest challenge probably we've faced for a long time, how to create a vaccine to respond to COVID-19, well, uh, maybe some of you know that DARPA actually provided seeded funding, uh, seed funding for Moderna that came with this mRNA technology that is very promising, not only for uh, the current crisis, but other um, viruses and illness going forward. So, uh, you know, it's a very recent and concrete example of the role of, of DARPA. The U.S., as you know, has other agencies that have similar mission-driven kind of uh, function, uh, NASA being one that most of you will know uh, and I would have followed over the years. ARPA-E is less known, but uh, plays an important role for energy and clean tech. Uh, and I'll just note that the U.K., the United Kingdom, just created their own version of DARPA, which, is, uh, which they called ARIA. Uh, and it was just announced over the last few weeks. So it'll be interesting, uh, but it's based on this mission challenge driven idea for uh, applied R&D. So just to summarize what, what, and to be clear about what we're asking here in Canada uh, in context of the budget and um, what I just described, we're not actually proposing a defense military research organization for Canada. What we would like to see is a new powerhouse uh, R&D agency, essentially, that imports all the benefits of a DARPA-like or DARPA-type institution and use it for a mission uh, or challenges approach. We think it needs to focus on fast rising, most promising growth sector. And uh, a lot of people will ask, how do you choose that? How do you select that? The good news is smart people have already done it. Uh, the Barton report has spent time and has quantified the sectors that uh, they think uh, the group thought that it was worth doubling down. And more recently, Monique Leroux and the Industry Strategy Council spent time and came to similar conclusions about uh, the most promising growth sectors. And I think when you look at those sectors, about four or five, uh, there are two that are very obvious and I think pretty consensual in the sense that uh, we know there are problems that we need to solve and huge opportunities in terms of new markets for Canadian firms. And those two are climate change, clean tech, and uh, bioscience. And the good thing about bio biosciences is that it has pretty broad applications on public health, on agriculture, and on many other uh, kind of um, subsectors. So the idea is really to create kind of a powerful public-private R&D bridge to commercialize uh, our ideas and to do transformative applied research. Uh, the other thing that a DARPA-like institution would do in our view is that it would create a, or would produce a new IP pipeline for Canadian firms. And as I mentioned, intellectual property is super important when you're trying to kind of distinguish yourself in one sector going forward. So um, because firm cannot work uh, in isolation, they need to work with suppliers, customers, universities, and the coordination aspect of it in Canada, I think is not well done and this is why I think, we think a DARPA-like institution could be super helpful. First, to set a direction on what needs to be solved, what needs to be addressed, but most importantly, bring together these players around the table and work uh, diligently to 
develop new technologies and new um, and new products. Uh, I'll um, I'll uh, end on the owl just briefly because I think it's important. Mm -hmm. The design of these institutions are kind of key. Um, I'll just mention a few things. First. Uh, one of the reasons that DARPA is successful, it has a very lean organization. Uh, we're talking about less than 200 people, essentially program managers that are hired for a time limited period to basically solve problems. And they are hired as experts, the lead teams of industry experts and scientists. So those are not by all respect and I all due respect to uh, civil servants led by bureaucrats. They are led by uh, scientists, and I think it's really important. Secondly, it has a very high degree of autonomy. So it, this is not a shiny object for politicians to change priorities over uh, you know, a year or two. This is about the long term, and it needs full independence. Third, uh, you need a culture of excellence. It needs to be a big deal for uh, people uh, to be invited to work at DARPA on these projects as project managers. It needs to be a prestigious thing and you need to bring the best scientists to solve uh, the problem. Uh, and then you need this public-private partnership. If industry is not at the center of it, I don't think it can work. And, and finally, another important on the how, and I'll, I'll finish on that, it needs to be de demand-driven. Uh, and what I mean by that is by um, applying mission and, and challenges, what you do is you attract new innovators to the issue you're trying to solve, and then you build new markets or innovation to solve them. And uh, one of the way to do that, and this is a condition of success in DARPA's case, and I think in Canada, we don't do this very well, is procurement. Uh, government mm -hmm. need to be a buyer. Uh, DARPA has various Car carve out uh, what they call uh, prize competitions uh, so that they can allocate to American agencies. In Canada, when you think about DND, the Canadian Space Agency, Hydro Quebec, public health system, there's a lot of potential for our public institutions to procure the solution we would be um, seeking. So I'll, I'll close on that. I, I hope. Yeah. I was able to summarize uh, our proposal and I welcome the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you, Robert, for that uh, uh, that introduction uh, to the topic because I think it gives us a lot to work with. So a couple of things um, off the top. I have a bunch of questions. Uh, audience questions are already coming in, which is fantastic. Um, I'm going to uh, both uh, leave a f uh, you know 15 minutes at the end to do them, but I'm, I'm also going to work them in as we go if they seem relevant to what we're talking about. So please keep those coming. Um, uh, Amanda, uh, our subscriber success manager is very kindly feeding them to us so I can see them, keep them going. Um, uh, you clearly don't need any encouragement from me, so that's great. Um, okay, so I want to step back a little bit uh, and talk about the context here. So, you know, at the end there, you were talking about, and I think you mentioned it off the top, um, uh, demand, sort of demand side innovation policy or demand driven innovation policy. Uh, what does that mean? What What is demand side policy? And what do we have now that you want to get away from? Yeah, that's key. And there's a lot of confusion about demand supply. What do we mean by that? I'll try to summarize it very uh, quickly. So supply side economics basically implies that by preventing you know, financial incentives, tax credits, for example, people will by default uh, innovate. Um, so if you create the, the conditions uh, by, uh, by supply means that innovation will kind of happen on its own. And what we're seeing is that, uh, you know, to stay uh, honest with ourselves, it, it has had mitigated results. It's not that it's an either or, that you need to eliminate tax credit and suddenly move to just demand driven, but I think you need a better mix. And what you mean by demand driven is this creation of new markets for these products mm -hmm. and services. Because if you don't have that, uh, you know, innovation uh, has limitation, you know, what, what does these products uh, life will be? Where will they be sold? And Canada is an exporting nation. So there, there's kind of a need to insert our innovation into these 
global supply chain and where we fit exactly, you know, think about, I don't know, electric vehicles. So if we are in the business now of trying to insert ourselves in the supply chain, where do we fit on the R&D side and the battery, for example, and how can we, you know, create a niche for Canada going forward is, I think, a good example of demand-driven innovation. So let's talk about uh, this uh, agency, this DARPA style agency in this context. And, uh, you know, just, just to sort of repeat, um, you know, Robert has already said he doesn't see this necessarily as a, a defense uh, agency. Um, it's more the model of DARPA applied to the yes. sectors or the areas in, of priority for um, whatever this would set up would be. Um, uh, so, uh, um, you know, we need this. We need this demand side approach, this market side, uh, market driven approach. How does how do the how does the challenge model um, from somewhere like DARPA or this agency that you're proposing create that demand? I mean, isn't are, isn't this just another form of sort of research competition? Uh, where's the demand? Yeah, well, the good thing about challenges, and I just want to say the King government has created what it's called an impact unit in the Privy Council office that has looked into this. And they just came out, I think, yesterday with kind of a new challenge a guide how this works. Uh, but essentially, the principles are quite straightforward. You know, you're trying to solve problems that are known uh, with unknown solution, and then you're trying to bring new innovators. Uh, in the equation to solve these problems and and therefore create new markets for these companies. Uh, that's kind of the general trust of it. And, you know, it has been proven to be very successful. Think about NASA. Uh, just recently, they procured uh, the issue, the procurement, the RFP, to uh, bring back lunar soil from the moon. So by doing so, uh, they have just created new demand for capability to go to the moon and bring back soil. Uh, it sounds, uh, you know, it, it sounds simplistic, but think about the market that it creates. Uh, and, and so it's the same in clean tech and it's the same in all the sectors. Um, the idea is uh, the government kind of directing what needs to be solved and then creating new markets by doing so. So I want to get a little deeper into that because this question of um, that that market and how sort of linked it ends up being to the government. So you know uh, we published the story whenever it was three weeks ago. Um, as with everyone in this pandemic, I have no sense of time. Also, the pre-budget period has like lasted way longer than any, any of us I think expected it to. Uh, but one one critique that you will have seen and that you know people were kind of making of this proposal was mm -hmm. um, you know how much of a market there is for the innovation or the products or the services that this challenge model is meant to create. So the the critique is that the model doesn't ensure that there are other customers beyond the government um, for this uh, kind of on an ongoing basis. Um, and uh, basically the idea is you know, you then create a new dependency on the government. Um, you've created this new solution for a government challenge, but who knows if there's a, 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 a commercial market uh, for this kind of thing. Um, and, you know, someone needs to figure out whether uh, there are those, in, there are, is that potential? Is that market big enough? Can a Canadian company win it? Um, how, do you, uh, how do you deal with those problems? Well, just think uh, about the simple example of a vaccine and what we just went through. A public crisis, a public health crisis we didn't expect came right in our face. And suddenly, oh, we realized we didn't necessarily have the capacity to deal with it. It was not the flu. It was not something that we were uh, expecting. What, what did we do? The government basically said, we need a vaccine, but I can't do a vaccine by myself, I need to work with the private sector, biopharma, to do it. And uh, by funding, you know, uh, applied R&D, it allowed, in my view, it, I think it, it, it's been demonstrated quite clearly, our pharma company globally to come up with a solution much faster that it would have been otherwise the case if they would have been on, the, on their own. The reality about private markets is, you need incentives to make money. And if uh, it's too risky to invest on a line 
on the long, lengthy R&D time frame, it's unlikely that people will invest. This is the, where the public R&D and the government role, to me, is kind of clear. Um, and in terms of uh, you know what needs to be solved, when you think about climate change, for example, I hope nobody disputes the idea that we're going to need some pretty important R&D to be commercialized to solve this problem. And again, uh, because some of it is very expensive, not economic, uh, the public R&D aspect is kind of a really important seed money to get to the finish line. So those, I think, are concrete example of what, I, what I'm trying to advocate here. Uh, it's interesting, that, and I don't mean to pick on those two examples, but I think they are interesting in this context. Each of those examples, the vaccine, mo probably more so than anything we've seen in, in a long time, is... Uh, you know, it's a public, uh, it's a public problem, right? Governments are procuring these these shots. They're paying for them. Um, they're administering them. There's a whole complex system that gets them uh, to market. But and you know, we're we're seeing some private sector actors, obviously in other countries, much more so, administering them. But the governments really are the clients. Like they need these vaccines to get their economies mm -hmm. going again. Uh, clean tech is another one where, you know, the government has emissions reduction goals, but presumably, you know, also there are companies that are going to need to meet goals and they'll have to adopt technology. Um, outside of those, those, those industries are already quite closely linked to government. Uh, you know, I, I'm wondering whether there's an application, there's a, a rationale for a challenge where, you know, government is going to be a one-time customer. Like your lunar, your lunar soil example is probably a good one, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, does... Does this kind of agency need to be linking those companies that it's bringing in or those researchers to bigger markets? Is there a uh, sort of matchmaking process that needs to accompany something like this? Yeah, I think the lunar soil example is interesting in a sense that the finality here is not necessarily to bring back dirt from the moon, is the possibilities of understanding and the new market it creates for further research and development and further products, uh, you know, going back to this specific example. So, you know, people might say in this X or Y sector, uh, the government will do something and then this thing will die. But I mean, it's just the beginning of discovery that will lead to something else. And I think when you think about the role of science technology in our society, there's not one sector that won't be driven by it. Software is everywhere. Data is everywhere. So how do we advance science, technology in these sectors so that we're more competitive? And I'll tell you something. If we don't do it, other countries will absolutely do it and uh, will be left in the dust. I think this is not an either or. This is something Canada needs to become much more intentional and understand that this is where the game is being played now. Uh, look around the world. Look at what Biden is coming in with in terms of uh, is science and technology agenda. Uh, think about Germany, think about uh, even countries like Australia who have been uh, similarly focused on uh, more traditional sectors that I think are you know, taking a very uh, kind of pro-growth approach going forward. Uh, so so we, we have a series of questions from the audience and I have a series of questions that are a variety of um, what about this thing we already have? Um, so uh, I want to go through some of them because I think some of them are instructive. Um, and and some of them, um, you know, uh, at least one of them was set up, uh, I, I believe, during your time in government, um, which is Innovative Solutions Canada. Um, yes. It's a program run out of ISED, but it involves the whole, most of the government now, I think. Um, and so for people who don't uh, know, that's a, uh, it's about $100 million a year. Uh, I think it's it's more like every year as the budgets go up. Uh, of companies, uh, of departments, uh, uh, budgeting R&D spending uh, or procurement spending uh, to set challenges um, to which companies can sort of pitch. Uh, and then they give companies, it's like $250,000 in the first stage and then up to a million dollars, basically turn uh, their, uh, their either an existing product or their innovation into uh, a solution that the government might use or something. Uh, there's all kinds of challenges. One recently that they closed um, involves using the blockchain to track steel imports. Um, it's way above my understanding, but something like that. Um, anyway, so Innovative Solutions Canada exists. The Defense Department has the Ideas Program, which is like closer akin to DARPA and that it is defense sort of our defense rationale. Uh, what's wrong with those? 
Nothing wrong. Those are absolutely essential and great programs. But in Canada, we have this tendency of doing it uh, not at scale. And this is the, the difference between really um, you know, moving the needle and just saying, OK, in this sector. And th this is not a criticism of these uh, programs. I think they are good ideas, and they probably work well. But at one point, you need to scale. And I'm, I know you were going to ask me about the super clusters. Uh, I, I think the same. I think by themselves, uh, I'm not ready to uh, say that they don't work because I don't think that at the current funding level, they have been able to really show the potential. And there are uh, all debate about how they work and what are the objectives and the outcomes. Those are all fair questions. And I think myself, I still have you know, a few um, question marks on how they should be designed. And, but on the idea, uh, you know, if we are going to move uh, boldly on the science technology agenda, we can't do it in the margin. We need to go bold. Other countries are doing it. And the reason why DARPA has been successful, it has a $3 billion budget yearly. Now, that's for the United States. That's 10, 10 times our economy. But still, uh, you need scale. Uh, you do something or you don't. And the, the, the observation I would make is that in Canada, we're too tentative about these things. You know, the question is not to, whether to have an industrial policy or don't have it. It's whether you have one that is intentional and that will achieve something uh, as opposed to trying to please everyone and kind of spread the peanut butter across uh, the country. So, I mean, that's the that's the comment I would make. Yeah, so um, uh, that's that's an interesting point. And I, I, I'm going to now, I, jumping off that, I want to ask um, basically two sides of the same question um, from two different angles, because the beauty of being a journalist is that, uh, you know, I don't have to commit to either. Um, so two, two problems uh, in uh, in the sort of Canadian economy uh, and with with sort of the, the corporate uh, sec the private sector. Um, that I want to uh, tackle in order. Uh, one is, um, and, and starting jumping off that point, so one is simply the capacity of Canadian companies to act as a market for Canadian innovation. So, yeah. you know, um, uh, some of your colleagues at uh, the Monk School have done a lot of research, uh, you know, and at uh, Brookfield as well, at Ryerson, have published all of these, these uh, papers about uh, technology adoption, basically, uh, to be impolite about it, Canadian companies are pretty bad uh, mm -hmm. at it. Um, you know, uh, accepting that Canada is an, uh, is an export focused country, but still, like, is there enough of a domestic market for innovation and technology created in Canada to give companies a launching pad? Like, if DARPA, if this DARPA style agency creates new uh, commercialization, is anyone in Canada actually going to buy? I mean, that's the kind of chicken and egg question. You know, how was Boeing created? If DARPA had been there, would it be Boeing today? I'm not sure, to be honest. Um, and, and so you have to start from an R&D proposition and then scale your companies. And obviously, uh, and I agree strongly with that, domestic demand is not enough to sustain. Canada is an exporting nation. But you know, countries that will succeed will have the firms that can compete globally because they will be innovative. That's the end game. Uh, but if your government is not a supporter, it doesn't procure, starting by procuring and enhancing innovation in Canada, then it's really starting from a bad position compared to your competitors, especially if everyone in the world seems to be doing it. And so I think that's kind of the logical steps. Uh, it is a launching pad, and then the goal is to go compete against, uh, you know, the global players. And I don't see any reason for Canada not to be able to do that. We have the human capital, we have the ideas, we have the universities, uh, research-intensive universities that can allow us to do this. Uh, I think, if anything, we're probably as 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 positioned as 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 best as we can be as a country. So this brings me to taking the other side of the issue just for the fun of it. Um, so um, uh, this one is one that you will have heard, uh, you know, the, the, the fundamental problem of uh, 
business spending on R and D being stagnant or falling yes. um, across the board, there are pockets uh, for you know as long as anyone can remember. Um, uh, and a version of this, uh, we will. Some of us will remember Mark Carney's piles of cash um, from uh, back when he was, uh, you know, uh, governor of the Bank of Canada. I think on his way out. Um, so uh, my question is, uh, you know, another potential issue here is that Canada might might just not have the companies or the innovators for this kind of program uh, that are that are doing the R and D, you know, based on those trends. Are we are we kind of putting the cart before the horse? We don't have the companies to make this work. Well, uh, no, I don't think so. If you look at uh, you know the potential that we have, uh, the existing infrastructure that we have. Uh, the rate of startups in Canada, there's a lot of room to scale companies, a lots of room. And I'm, I'm seeing that in bioscience in, in British Columbia, in Ontario, everywhere in the country. Uh, in clean tech is the same. I think it's a very promising sector for Canada. But obviously you need ambition and you need government to be part of the solution. Uh, this notion that private markets on their own uh, will kind of fix uh, what needs to be fixed uh, is, I think, uh, kind of a ne neoliberal view of the economy that has shown uh, limitations, to be honest. So um, the, the idea, I think, is really to double down on your strengths, uh, scale, be focused. This the agency cannot do 15 things, you know, it needs to be focused on two, three sectors and really putting the resource that it needs to grow our, our sectors and double down on our strengths. Uh, the danger, of course, is that, you know, we become not ambitious enough and that results uh, become uh, underwhelming. Um, but, you know, the, the business R&D issue is uh, complex, uh, but essentially, and this is not a criticism, I think small and medium enterprise are really important to this country. Uh, but our ratio of what is called SME, small, medium enterprise, versus large firm is way too big compared to the U.S. We have about a, a third uh, uh, percent of, uh, you know, essentially two-thirds less of large firms that the U.S. has. And that ratio is just not sustainable. You know, large firm invest more in R&D, invest more in the economy. And we need more of it. So we need to scale companies. This is the fundamental uh, problem we need to solve in our economy is uh, we cannot have an economy of startups and small SMEs. And again, this is not a criticism. These people are admirable and they do amazing work. But on the macro side, you just need more larger firms to compete. So this uh, this agency, this new program doesn't, uh, it, there's not, it doesn't necessarily directly solve the uh, the corporate R and D spending problem. There's a second order effect you're suggesting. It it's it'll help get that scale that then creates more of that spending in the economy. It also creates a synergy. We're not asking for like a bailout or uh, the government to come and, and cover all the R and D expenses. What you want is to bring your own skin in the game and companies to say, okay, I'm going to work on this problem. I know I have some backing uh, mm -hmm. with this agency, and then I'm committed for the long term to work to develop certain services and products and technologies. This is the idea. You know, people, if we create such an agency and people expect that six months after or a year after we'll have uh, 12 new technologies, then we're failed, uh, we're bound to fail. You know, like this is. I risk, I reward, and I, I encourage everyone to read uh, Jacobson's uh, book on uh, DARPA's history. I think it's called The Pentagon's Brain. It's an amazing book about the evolution of what they were able to accomplish, but the risk, frankly, that they took on some of the stuff, and there are some failures. Uh, and I'll just say on the failures, we, fi we failed quite a bit already <laughs> with the money we give to companies. and. Uh, with the money we invest in innovation. So the idea is um, let's try to build something for the long term, not just to try to accomplish a few short term kind of key successes. 
So uh, I want to uh, ask uh, one uh, one other question, sort of jumping off that, and this is something that someone uh, raised, I think, quite early on um, around uh, risk uh, risk tolerance. Um, but I want to broaden that out to talk a little bit just about government capacity because you've been inside, yes. uh, you know, inside uh, the the building at wherever it is over somewhere. Um, uh, when these decisions are being made, um, you know, if if we accept sort of as a given that you know you're going to have you're going to need people who understand um, some of these markets, you know, who are able to get to grips with the technology, as you say, DARPA employs scientists uh, yeah. to evaluate. We already have some of these models with like IRAP uh, technology uh, yes. advisors, uh, but uh, but you know you're talking about a, a pretty big uh, undertaking. Does government have the capacity, the expertise, the personnel uh, to do this? And the risk tolerance, frankly, because, you know, as you say, something like ISC set up whatever it was three years ago now, $100 million is a very small part of procurement. That's the scale at which we operate. And, and I don't know that they have the expertise in those areas that they're setting up challenges for. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, uh, if I look at this, uh, objectively, implementation is my biggest concern because let's be honest, government is not always the best to implement, but that's not a good enough excuse not to do it. The, the core reality is this can be run by civil servants with all due respect uh, or, bur or typical bureaucrats. If, for example, we let the Treasury Board Secretary run the HR process for this thing, it won't work. It absolutely won't work. We better not do it. And I say this with the greatest respect because you need independence, you need nibbleness, you need scientists who have full independence on what they're doing. And if politicians, you know, meddle and say, oh, I don't like this project and this one, I'm not sure, maybe you can change it a bit or try to put it in my writing, then, you know, we're, 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 we're gonna, it's gonna be a massive failure. So the design of this thing is actually super important. And, the, it, you know, fortunately for us, DARPA show us the way on how to do it. The recipe is there. And I know it's not easy to necessarily translate to our innovation ecosystem. We've never done it before, but you cannot em employ, uh, you know, people like we have done for the NRC and other institution, again, with the greatest respect for these people and what they have accomplished for the country. Uh, it's quite admirable, uh, but you need, you need, this need to have an edge and you need the best scientists and you know someone to be asked to go to this agency and work for two years wants to have a sabbatical from her uh, or his university and uh, you know try to do this uh, for, for the right reason. So I think this is the model that we need to focus on as opposed to creating another program in, inside ISED to, to be frank. Yeah, and I, I note that you know I, I know in talking to companies that they find uh, IRAP in particular to be quite useful because there's already some of this built in versus some of the other programs which don't necessarily have that sort of um, industry or um, or sort of domain expertise. Uh, but I want to but I want to move to uh, to asking a couple of uh, to try and consolidate a couple of questions we got uh, from uh, from the audience um, uh, just about benefits uh, about ensuring that the benefits actually um, sort of flow to the Canadian economy. Yeah. Um, so I think these are two versions of the same problem, uh, but. Uh, you know, we have many issues with the net benefits of the Canadian innovation economy flowing steadily, maybe structurally to other jurisdictions. Um, solving pro um, So, you know, how do we ensure that they're solving uh, problems directed to long-term domestic ca capability and capacity? And then a version of this, how do we ensure that firms use this to expand uh, their operations using the public R&D funding that they're gonna get here? And also the IP doesn't leave the country. So IP is very central and we've been very naive. I, I, I just want to say, I, I see uh, some uh, some changes that I think are consequential and I commend I said for doing it. Uh, when I think about the patent collective, for example, that has been put forward, I think people realize now they understand an intellectual property. And again, just go back to my previous comments. It cannot be that our public R&D uh, as an investment in a productive capacity as a country ends up, you know, going, being leaked uh, exclusively to foreign firms. 
uh, or elsewhere because it's a really bad externality if you think about uh, economics. You know, it, it needs to uh, help your country grow. And so the IP pipeline is super important. And, uh, you know, for a long time, I've been advocating for more patent creation, retention in, in Canada. And I think this model fits well with it because it would create a pipeline of IP that we will be able to nurture, to protect, to enhance. The other thing that a dark ally constitution does is it brings idea into kind of, think of it almost as a lab, you know, and then it, it kind of builds it, it nurtures it so that it's ready to be commercialized. And that everybody that works in innovation knows that that's the kind of difficult phase of innovation. And I think uh, when you look at these mission-driven agencies, they have proven to work exactly, you know, in this important uh, kind of phase of IP development. So do you attach sort of riders to these challenges? Do you say, you know, if you are participating, if you're getting funding, you have to, uh, you know, uh, keep your corporate headquarters here. You can't, uh, you know, you, uh, or is there some kind of return mechanism? Like how do we structure this so that, you know, companies don't just take the money and then move to San Francisco or, uh, you know, uh, sell out yeah. in three years to a giant company that takes their IP and moves it away? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're already, uh, if you look at a program like SIF, Strategic Innovation Fund, they already has IP provisions. Uh, same with super clusters. I think we're more live to this uh, problematic. Obviously, there's a fine line between being protectionist and closing your markets to foreign companies, and we don't want to do that. Uh, but, you know, it, it's obvious that IP is where value resides. And if people are just able to come here, pick up whatever we have and run with it, then we're just not being very smart about how we do innovation. That's kind of a obvious statement to make, I think. So uh, I want to uh, address a few of the other questions that, that we didn't get to around the, you know, isn't this a version of um, X? Uh, and I think they're, they're all good questions. Um, we could spend, quite, sorry, spend quite a lot of time going through them, but one thing that I wanted to highlight was that Robert talked about at the top, you know, it, um, it, uh, you know, it doesn't need to, uh, essentially that, you know, the, the, uh, he's not being overly prescriptive about the specific form of it. And I think that's important as, as sort of a way of, of dealing with it. it. It's not to say that these things couldn't be linked to other programs, but I want to ask um, this one um, sort of about the public good. And then I have a couple of other things I just want to talk about. Uh, we, we, you know, uh, you and I talk quite often about sort of the, the broader uh, economic piece and uh, uh, want to touch on a couple of other things in that letter um, that you sent to the uh, finance minister. But to start with, um, uh, I want to ask this one because I think it's interesting and I've been having some conversations around this kind of thing. How do you respond to the critique that it's unfair when governments and the public who bankroll the development of the underlying technologies that, for example, make the iPhone work, uh, see no upside in Apple's success while shareholders are getting, you know, uh, mm. this has millions of dollars in market cap, you know, uh, dividends, their, their stocks are going up. Uh, essentially, is there, uh, you know, the, the, the government likes to announce that it's investing in things, yes. um, which I hate because it's usually loans. Uh, but does there need to be more of a, a feedback mechanism there? That's an interesting question. You know, some have argued, uh, I think if you look, for example, at what Mariana Mazzucato is advocating, that high risk, high reward should mean that if you succeed, government should share, or citizens or taxpayers, I guess, should share part of the successes as much as they would share uh, part of the failure. And I think that's a fair argument. I, I don't have a definitive view on it, but I, I think it makes sense that uh, if a company is successful with the investments that we've made, that there are certain uh, kind of um, innovator returns that we need to kind of think about. Uh, and I, I, I'm not going to engage in the specifics, but I think uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a reasonable proposition, I think. Uh, to have some uh, to demand in return of investments to have certain things in return. I IP is an obvious one, but there are uh, others, uh, you know, without going into uh, kind of uh, not respecting the capitalist frame that we live in, you know, uh, and, uh, and, and enhance capital investments. But still, I think th th there could be a, a few uh, 
uh, a few things that would be worth looking at. Um, so uh, we've talked quite a lot about companies uh, today and you know, um, uh, sort of research in the abstract. I want to talk about work a little um, because I think these things are all tied in uh, skills, capacity, you know, um, uh, people, uh, yeah, you know, the, uh, the business council's letter uh, was divided into sections. One of them is people. And I know that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, skills and training has been a, a longstanding issue. Um, there was a lot of work before the last budget um, two years ago now uh, around training. Um, you know, this is another one of those like perennial Canadian economic problems, right? The yeah. idea that Canadian uh, employers don't invest enough in skills and training. Uh, and bef uh, in October 2019, around the budget time, uh, I, which, uh, you know, I know was, uh, I think be just before you got to the Business Council, but um, there, uh, the, the members of the Business Council had promised to match US peers spending on training uh, by 2025. I'm wondering in the post pandemic economy, you know, we've got these trends, digitization, automation, obviously a whole bunch of people thrown out of work. Um, are companies really going to, uh, are companies going to make commitments to uh, scaling and training? Do you see that that trend kind of write, writing itself uh, in the post-pandemic recovery? This is a very central question, Rad. And I think um, business, we do think businesses have a responsibility. Absolutely. They need to be part of the solution. We, we are working actively to develop these options, but we think there should be more business-led uh, kind of uh, a more straightforward role for business in, in rescaling and upscaling. And I think if you talk to our CEOs, it's the first thing they will tell you is that this is an urgent matter. If this country, what, what happens in such a rapid transformation of our economy that is happening is that you have fast growing sectors where you don't have enough workers, qualified workers to fill the jobs. And then you have, unfortunately, sectors are really struggling that are stuck with a lot of workers that are not employed product productively or not paid enough or you know unemployed, frankly, because there's a lack of demand in these sectors. So you need to do these shift very fast, and we don't have you know 200 years to do that. Uh, but you know we've been supporting a pilot, for example, uh, Arvind Gupta, University of Toronto, has put forward this amazing pilot that is scaling very fast. We hope the government will support it, but it responds exactly. To this uh, kind of idea of rescaling uh, that can't take four years or five years or two university degrees, but that needs to be really nimble and adjust to how the markets uh, are moving. Yeah, and actually, uh, I've, I've seen a lot of really interesting uh, initiatives in this area. Um, I'm, uh, I'm hoping to write about it at some point. Um, so uh, other journalists on the call don't steal my ideas, but uh, I think there are interesting uh, uh, fixed term programs and you know, we think, seen things like coding schools and stuff like that, that are uh, trying to sort of rework that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think it's often, it's often sort of framed as like disrupting traditional education, but I think yes. it's, uh, it's more interesting to think of it as like specific skills for specific problems for workers and, you know, specific. Yes. Plans. Um, I want to ask about a, a sort of related part of this, which is, you know, uh, we've seen various uh, plenty of evidence that uh, this recession has particularly affected women workers, yes. uh, both, you know, within industries uh, and also because industries that tend to have more uh, women in their workforces have been disproportionately affected yes. by the pandemic. Uh, you know, the letter calls for governments to uh, commit to childcare and early learning. I think that's a that's a policy that's been talked about a lot. But I'm wondering whether there are um, there are sp specific there's a there's a, a space here or a, a timeliness around specific policies around skills training. Uh, you know, industry. Um, to get uh, women uh, yes. back into the workforce and, and increase their participation? Yes, I mean, childcare is the obvious one, and we've been very supportive, very proactive, saying how important, central it is. And I hope, to be honest, that, again, on implementation, it won't take 10 years before we get there, because I think it's quite urgent. And they have been uh, great advocates. A lot of our CEOs have been at the forefront of this, uh, you know, on the implementation side, uh, enough to say that there are various models you can use. Uh, I'm, I'm a Quebecer. I understand the, the appeal to the Quebec model. There are other ways also to, for the private sector to play a role uh, in delivery. 
And there are also you know, tax incentives that can be deployed uh, to shape the market. But uh, this is a key priority. The, the other thing is the hard reality is that there are segments of our labor uh, market, labor force, that are underrepresented. And we need to make sure for indigenous, for example, for racialized Canadians, for women, that we do a much better job at integrating them, giving them a push uh, so that they can um, you know, they can make our economy more productive, frankly, and that they have a better life for their families. And I think this is a problem that we've identified as a council and that we're working very diligently to, to address going forward. And yes, businesses have a role uh, to play in there. It's not just about government, absolutely. Um, so I want to um, uh, I want to leave off uh, by uh, asking by stepping back uh, and asking a question uh, about innovation policy yes. post pandemic. So you know when uh, when the Liberals took office uh, in 2015, those first couple of years, there was an innovation. You know the innovation and skills plan that former uh, innovation minister Baines used yes. to talk about a lot. There was a, um, a review. There was a review of all the programming. There was some consolidation that happened. You know, the SIF is one outcome, super cost is mm-hmm. another, all this happened. The government's talking in broad terms about building back better economic transformation, all of these big things. Um, do you think it's time for another one of these reviews? Um, or, or to ask the question another way, three years ago, did they get it right? Uh, if we need another new, if we need a new program as you're advocating for, if we need yeah. policy we're fine. Did, do they need to do this again? I, I, I frankly don't uh, want to revisit the past because I don't think there's much we can do about it. But I, I know that there's a lot we can do for the future. And this is an important moment, Rab. I think you, you implied it in your remarks. Biden, President Biden came into office and he sent a letter to his new science advisor, uh, Eric Lander. Uh, and it was a very similar letter that FDR sent to Vannevar Bush in the 40s, basically asking five questions. Are we going to use science technology to solve our problem and to grow our economy? This is the question. This is what we need to do in Canada. And I don't see why we would be shorting ourselves, saying we can't do this because we're too small or not ambitious enough or our companies are not big enough. This is no time for excuses. This is a moment that is really important, I think, the next few years where we need to double down on our strength. So I don't want to go into the programs and, you know, this is complicated. But what I'll say is this is a time to be intentional. This is a time to double down on what we think we can be good at and stop trying to be everything for everyone. Uh, I know it's easier said than done, but we need some long-term vision here. We need some some purpose to what we're trying to achieve and the result i think in five ten years could be really really consequential on what we do now how do we meet this moment and i'm convinced that we can do it but we're going to have to start uh doing a few big bets here and we think that this darpa like proposal is one of, is one of them so this is how we uh we want to meet the moment well, uh, I could clearly talk about this forever, but we should let people go. Um, so I think that's a good note uh, to end on. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. Um, we really appreciate uh, you taking the time to listen to us talk about this today. Uh, thank you so much to uh, Robert uh, and to the BCC uh, for uh, agreeing to do this with us. Uh, and uh, personally, thank you to Robert for uh, answering the phone uh, regularly when I call. Uh, I really appreciate <laughs> it. Right. Much, much appreciated. Uh, thank you to our business team, uh, uh, Amanda Roth, our uh, subscriber success manager, who some of you um, will have talked to in the past, is fantastic. Uh, producer John Backman, who's been um, making sure we look and sound good today, um, and uh, the rest of our business team uh, as well. Uh, subscribers, uh, please keep a, uh, an eye out for future conference calls. Um, I've done uh, uh, more than my fair share in the last little while, so you won't be seeing me for a while, I think. Uh, but other people, uh, we have lots of great other people. Um, and if you're not a subscriber yet, what are you doing? Um, and uh, uh, the logic.co slash subscribe uh, can help you fix that. Uh, we, uh, in all seriousness, really appreciate um, all of our subscribers. It's uh, what makes all of this possible. Uh, thanks so much and have a great afternoon.